name is uh, Robert Cameron. I work at primarily at UCLA, but I wear a number of hats. Um, and uh, one of them is the, uh, the director of the Punch Worthington Research Laboratory uh, and the UCLA Mesothelioma Program. Punch Worthington was a patient of mine who uh, actually died of asbestos induced lung cancer. And, and uh, he was a very well educated uh, person. He had a PhD in immunology and he was very interested in. Um, you know, in his, in his final days of really pushing the envelope in terms of research. So he has helped sponsor, and, and his son, Roger Willington, who also sponsoring this meeting, has helped sponsor a lot of our research uh, into new ways of treating mesothelioma. Uh, and I also work at the West LA VA Medical Center, where I'm Chief of Thoracic Surgery and for the Pacific Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which also sponsors the uh, research. Just to give a little history, it's interesting because I'm actually I majored in medieval history when I was in college, and, and it was interesting just to find out that the initial really descri description of what could be mesothelioma dates back to King Louis the, the 16th uh, in France, where his personal physician did 3,000 autopsies and noted two patients that had what looked like mesothelioma. And there's a lot of other people that actually describe uh, the entity long before the 1960 association by, by Wagner. So it's, a, it's an old disease, and I'm sure it predates that. And, and like uh, um, real estate, oh, maybe not this nowadays, but uh, location, location, location is important in real estate, but asbestos, asbestos, asbestos is the cause of mesothelioma. Uh, and all those other people that talk about SD40 viruses from polio vaccine and other things, I mean, you look through the literature, which I've done for a lot of these different things, you can't find a single case that really is proven as a cause of mesothelioma, and most of the cases don't even talk about an asbestos history in the patient, so you don't even know if they even found if there was any asbestos exposure. So really, the only known known cause is asbestos. And this is what we're talking about, these fibers, the different fiber types. I included fiberglass, although that's not one of the fiber types, but it, it does uh, compare in terms of the appearance, but the chemical nature of the, of the uh, asbestos. And as you heard earlier, all asbestos uh, it has uh, disease-producing capabilities. Now, mesothelioma gets talked about by a lot of people as mesothelioma, and it's not really one disease or more than one disease. In fact, there's really three basic diseases. One is an epithelioid uh, disease, which is, involves big fat cells that appear to be similar to lung cancer. And then there's a second type, that's about 40% of the, the cases, a second type called sarcomatoid, and that's small little thin cigar-shaped cells. And those two types uh, behave exactly the opposite, really. Uh, the epithelioid kind of stays localized for a long period of time, and the sarcomatoid spreads very vigorously to other parts of the body. And so you have to distinguish which one you're, you're dealing with because the behavior is a lot different. The biphasic is a combination of both. And at UCLA, uh, pathologists have a, a habit of, at UCLA of combining the, the biphasic and describing what percentage is, is epithelioid versus sarcomatoid so we can more accurately distinguish what the patient should be treated with because they're treated completely differently. And so what I'm going to talk about for the rest of my talks, I only have a certain amount of time, is really the epithelioid type, which is the predominant type in most patients. And this does, but this doesn't apply to people with sarcomatoid mesothelioma. And the pr predominantly, the biggest um, characteristic of mesothelioma that's different from almost, almost every other cancer is that it's a diffuse disease from the beginning. Uh, and it's never really a solitary or localized disease. And all their cancers, not, um, almost all the cancers start as a nodule somewhere. So you can treat that in a much different way because you can take it out, you can do other types of local therapy and, and cover the whole area, but the diffuse nature of mesothelioma makes it very hard to deal with. So if you've seen, these are CT scans, and they're like, you know, slicing up your body like a salami cutter and then looking at them like you're looking from your feet towards your head. So this is the left, this is the right, this is the air outside the body is dark and the air in the lungs is dark. And these are basically normal looking lungs, but you see these little lumps over here on the right side, and that's the mesothelioma. And as you can see, it kind of goes around the entire <coughs> outside of the lung. But the other thing to notice is that you can see relatively smooth surfaces between the lung and the, the tumor, and as opposed to lung cancer, which will, will appear more like a star because it, it put, puts out tentacles invading into the lung. So mesothelioma actually, until pretty late in disease, actually doesn't involve the lung. It's just around it, and that has, comes into play uh, when you're figuring out the treatment. And this is the inside of somebody's chest with mesothelioma, and what you see is basically a lot of little irregular white areas this is the diaphragm. You can't really tell that unless you really know what you're looking at. This is the lung that's been collapsed, and this is the back of the rib. So 
all the surfaces are covered by these little white nodules, which are all tumor. And so you can see it's a really diffuse uh, tumor, and there's a little bit of fluid left over that we took out. And this is what it looks like after you put talc powder in there. So if you ever wondered what it looks like, it looks like a little snowstorm, which is something we don't see in Southern California, but other places. And this is really the problem. So in the, in the normal lung, you have a visceral pleural, which is the lining on, on the lung itself, which is as thin as kind of cellophane. And then you have the parietal pleural, which is on the back of the ribs, and a potential space between the two. And when you get tumor that develops in that area, it kind of go, oops, it goes around the lung. And in reality, it's very interesting because I've had a few patients that come in that, that have almost no nodules in their entire chest. They have a pleural effusion, we look inside, and you find a few nodules just scattered here and there. And when you, and most people would treat that, just let's say it's minimal disease, let's, let's just take out the nodules or treat it with something like chemotherapy. The problem is, when we've gone in and done surgery on those patients to remove the entire pleural surface, there isn't any normal pleura in that patient. It's all tumor, even though it looks grossly normal. So this is a kind of disease that you can't assume just because something looks normal that it is. This is a, a dynamic uh, real-time MRI scan, which we're doing on patients, because it shows really, the diff number one, the diffuse nature of the disease, but also it shows what it does to patients even before uh, you do any therapy. So this is a patient uh, and it's like looking at their body sliced this way, straight up and down, and you're looking at the, the body from front to back, like a chest x-ray. So this is actually the heart, this is some blood vessels, this is the left lung over here, it's dark, and over on the right side, it has a large pleural effusion, a lot, a lot of fluid that's basically filling the entire chest. And the interesting thing about these x-rays, if I can get this to work, um, it actually moves. You can actually see somebody breathing, and you can see what the tumor and the pleural uh, effusion does to the patient in terms of their breathing. And you can see that it affects all the surfaces. You can see it affecting the ribs. The ribs don't move, the, the diaphragm doesn't move, and, and uh, the heart and other blood vessels are appear fixed by the tumor. So the bottom line, I think, with mesothelioma, because of the diffuse nature, and I'm not saying this in a negative way necessarily, but it's, it's reality is that a cure is really not possible because there is no way to take out your entire chest cavity, which would include all your ribs, all the muscle between the ribs, you know, the diaphragm, the heart, all the blood vessels. So you can't cure this like, the, like you would with breast cancer or colon cancer. And it, it's not being negative, it's just being realistic about how you need to approach mesothelioma. So the approach has to be different. So really, the treatment paradigm is not to cure somebody, but to convert what is otherwise a life-threatening uh, asbestos-related disease to a chronic treatable disease, which is what we do all the time in other diseases. So it's, there's kind of this thought in medical oncology that we have to take somebody with cancer and hit them with everything that we got until they get cured or we, or we lose. And, and that's not really what we do with other diseases and other areas of medicine. For instance, high blood pressure and diabetes, those patients are incurable. But yet they can live for 40, 50 years if they're managed appropriately. So uh, the, the way to approach Mesothelioma is that we're not going to cure the disease, but maybe you can do something, a lot of different things, to, to keep people going for a long time, which is what we've been doing at UCLA for the last uh, 12 years or so. So the other thing is, like uh, Dr. Harbert uh, mentioned, is to prevent asbestos-related diseases. And the way to prevent it is to prevent exposure in the first place and ban asbestos, which is very, very important, and also to prevent the development of the disease, because it's in asbestos-related individuals, a lot of people know uh, they've been exposed. I mean, not all know, but a lot of people do know. And there's a period of 30, 40 years before any serious malignant disease develops. And during that period of time, it's, it's like you're a time bomb. You're doing nothing. But there's a period of time when we can develop therapies that potentially can prevent the progression to disease. So those are the areas that we're really interested in, in concentrating on. Uh, so the options, basically, in normal oncology is that you have surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Those are the big three. So in the past, people who have treated this disease have basically taken all three and said, we're going to hit somebody with all three as much as we can. So you do radical operation, you do high-dose radiation, and then do aggressive chemotherapy. And the end result usually is that you didn't really do much for the disease, and the patient's been very sick for the last few months to a year of their life, and, and they're miserable. So a different approach needs to be taken, and this is part of the reason is that, and again, the tumor, you have, this is tumor, the white area on top of the lung in here. So you can see the tumor kind of goes into the little septi, they go into the lung and around it. But again, it's not really invading into the lungs, a relatively smooth surface that goes around there. And when you do surgery, you're basically going right next to the tumor 
uh, and leave in, leaving no margin, basically, as opposed to what you'd like to do, which is get a big margin around the whole thing, but that's just not possible. So you have to accept that and, and come up with other strategies. So people that have been on the other side of the fence and want to do radical operations and think uh, and tell people that they're going to get all the tumor out are really fooling themselves. And this is basically a summary, I've you know, kind of coned it down to just the median survival, which is the time period that it takes until half the patients who've been treated with any one treatment will die. And here you see the variety of, of uh, studies that have shown median survivals uh, in patients who have had extra pleural pneumonectomies, which is taking the lung out with the pleura, and versus pleurectomy decortication, which is just taking out the pleura and leaving the lung. And you can see that the numbers are all basically the same. They range from anywhere from 5.4 months for an EPP to, to 18, 19 months, and for pleurectomies anywhere from 7 to 9 to 20. So they're all the same numbers. So there really is no data whatsoever ever in any part of the literature that suggests that taking out the lung helps. And that's what makes oncologic sense because you're close to the lung, you're close to the tumor, you're not gaining any margin, and uh, you're not helping anybody get better. This is actually from an operation which shows that we can take out the tumor without the lung, without any problem. I do this on every single case, and I can do it 85% of the time in, in patients that come to see me. So basically here, this is a chest that's open. This is a rib that's been taken out. And this is all, this whole surface area is tumor. It's a diffuse tumor that you see when you open up the chest. And I've, in this area, cut down through the tumor, which is this thick stuff, and there's the lung underneath of it. And so there's a way you can deal with all this, and eventually what happens down the bottom is you have, this is the nice soft lung tissue, it looks like a sponge, and this is the tumor coming off of it. And you end up at the end with this big tumor, and this is about 30 centimeters across, and you know, with a, with a normal looking lung. And it, it works perfectly fine, it re-expands perfectly fine, doesn't matter how much tumor is on it, it actually uh, works pretty well. So you can take out all the tumor that you can see 85% uh, of the time. And this is some data from um, Harvey Pass, who just showed that if you take out as much tumor as possible, if you're successful in doing that, patients tend to live longer. So this is patients that live longer than patients where you couldn't take out all the tumor. So there is evidence that suggests that doing this operation, even though it's not taking out all the tumor, can help people live longer. So if you then want to add in radiation in a sensible way, we add radiation after this, even though the lung is there, and it makes it a little harder, but it's, it's doable. So this is how our radiation uh, physicians plan the therapy. And if you look at the, the, the data, there's not a lot of it, it suggests that, that radiation after surgery does help. Here's some data that we have done where patients that refused radiation or didn't get it basically died within a few months. And after surgery, if you got radiation, the, the, uh, again, the median survival was around 17 to 18 months, which is the, the usual typical thing that people report. And it's the same as, as David Sugarbaker's data from Boston in terms of doing extra pleural pneumonectomies. So this, that is a basically uh, the basic treatment is to get the tumor out. And that, like I said, you've done 85% of the time, which is pretty successful. Uh, and better than this, which is chemotherapy. And pemetrexid, which is a limp and cisplatinum, has been uh, a good advantage because in a, in a randomized trial, phase three showed that there is increased survival in, on average from, by three months. What you don't get told most of the time is that the responses were only in about 40 to 45 percent of patients, so that's a minority of the patients respond. So over 60 percent of patients potentially progress during this period of time, which is not helpful. And there's significant toxicity. A lot of patients come back after chemotherapy, they're very sick. Uh, and uh, if you give this chemotherapy after surgery, there's nothing to monitor, so you don't know whether it's working or not. So there's all kinds of potential uses, but also problems with using chemotherapy. So that's, that's actually not part of our usual treatment protocol, because we don't think that there's good ways to follow this after surgery, and doing it as initial treatment, which a lot of people do, is not a good uh, approach because we can get 85% of the tumor out in, in our patients and if you get chemotherapy you have a 40% chance of even responding and the response is usually minimal. So after we do our surgery and radiation, what do we do to follow up? And again, this is a chronic disease, so we have chronic therapies that we treat people with as maintenance. So there are other things that can be used. Some patients have little localized areas of nodules that come back and, and we now use radiofrequency ablation, cryoablation, which are just needle uh, catheter-based uh, treatments as well as <clears throat> a special radiation treatment that's now available, it's only been available for the last few years, to really locally treat tumors. Uh, and when they come back in little areas, we can do this and people keep 
living on and, and it has very little impact on your life, which is an important option. So what else can we add to this? We've been looking at hyperthermia because a lot of people use that because it turns out most of the things we're finding is that hyperthermia is not useful. Um, but we concentrate on is what is called alpha interferon and IL-4. The alpha interferon has been around for years, been used for other tumors, uh, and we've taken an interesting approach is using it for maintenance therapy because obviously the tumor doesn't take a vacation. Chemotherapy is a, given in a kind of unique way because they give high doses every three weeks. So you give a high dose today and then you no treatment essentially for three weeks because you need to recover. And meanwhile, the, the tumor is also recovering and growing. So it doesn't really make sense to kind of leave the tumor untreated for three weeks. So what we wanted to do is treat patients every single day of their life. Um, and this is kind of where we got the idea. This is a giant cell tumor bone, which um, Chuda Folkman in Boston had treated. It's a big <coughs> tumor in this, in this uh, girl's jaw. And they had done the surgery three times, trying to take it out. It grew back three times very vigorously. So what they did actually, they tried to treat the patient with interferon for the same reasons why it might be effective in mesothelioma because it tends to make blood vessels and over about a year to year and a half the tumor went away. So what we started doing is treating patients with interferon which is low dose, patients have almost no symptoms at all from it, they take it every day and unfortunately it's an injection so it's a little bit difficult to, to give but, it, but uh, they take it every day and when we look at our patients who have had uh, no interferon, the patients have interferon, the ones that got interferon, and these are self-selected patients, so it's not a randomized trial, have done far better than in patients that have not done interferon. So we think this is showing some promise, and we've uh, been talking to the drug company about starting a, a more, a bigger phase two trial to see if this holds up, and if it does, then to do a randomized trial, but, but it's very, very uh, promising. And the other thing is interleukin-4, which we've <clears throat> with iropacin at the NIH and developed a toxin to. Uh, IL-4 is just a certain type of, re a certain molecule you normally produce. It has to do with the immune system normally. Uh, and there's a receptor that, that uh, is on mesothelioma cells. And it happens to be, for unknown reasons, that the mesothelioma cells have huge numbers of these receptors as opposed to normal cells, which have almost none. And so we, there's this toxin that's been tagged to this molecule that could be given to patients. And we've done some studies in animals. These are studies done in mice uh, that showed up there this vertical thing is the way tumors, that are human tumors taken out of our patients and put into mice grow normally without any treatment. And if we give this toxin just into the tumor, you can see at low dose and high dose, basically the, the growth just stops and is very slow and delayed. And if you look at animals treated this way, they, we have a group that had 100% survival for 100, up to 180 days, uh, which is very hard to do because normally the mice die within 40 days of the tumors. So it seemed to be quite promising. Um, and unfortunately, as other things do, we want to develop this at, for mesothelioma, but the, the actual molecule was licensed by a company that was uninterested in mesothelioma and kept talking about lung cancer, breast cancer, other cancers because they can't see making money off of mesothelioma. So it got hung up for a number of years just waiting to be able to develop it and have the money to develop it. And recently we do have a sponsor now to help get clinical trials going. So we're now applying for an FDA IND for this in use in humans. They're going to use it during surgery, after surgery to perfuse the chest and also to inject into local recurrences. So this is, I think, is a very, very promising uh, molecule. The other thing that we're doing in the lab is to try and establish more information because there's really very little good information out there. Uh, and for years, uh, I've talked about getting a registry together to have patients themselves put in information into a registry that can be searched and researched by uh, researchers all across the world. And, and so I spent a lot of time trying to develop uh, an internet-based system uh, where patients can just log on, they can create their own website, uh, their own uh, access and put information about their treatment, their tumor, into a, a common data store. And we're doing this as an international thing where people can do it in other languages. Uh, and then researchers will be able to anonymously check your information along with all the other people that put their information in to try and look for uh, promising new things and, and treatments. Because for the most part, each, each uh, center in the United States treats people the way they feel they should. And none of the data is put together, so there's never a huge amount of data from any one center, and it's very hard to tell what really is successful, like extra pleural pneumonectomy, because people change the data in certain ways to make it look useful when maybe it isn't. And the other thing that we don't get information on is really the uh, symptomatology of patients. So this system is set up to ask 
questions about symptoms, like how much, how much are you short of breath and all that kind of stuff, so we can collect symptoms in terms of treatment responses so we can find out how patients are doing, and we're going to be hopefully launching this by this summer. And the other thing is prevention strategies, which, which we're going to be looking into, and particularly that 40-year period of time when people know they have asbestos and uh, can be um, treated. We're going to look at anti-inflammatory drugs to try and prevent the development of disease. So in summary, I think that mesothelioma should be treated differently than what most oncologists are used to. It should be treated as a chronic disease like um, diabetes, high blood pressure, and any one of a number of other diseases that physicians treat. And treatment strategies have to be developed in light of that, which will be, I think, more successful in trying to go for a home run. But the most important thing is, of course, is don't ever give up, even though it may look pretty grim.